Shalom, shalom to everyone watching on the Ways of Israel. This is Rabbi Moshe Otero with the Ways of Israel. We had uh, previously some technical difficulty trying to uh, get uploaded the video or the live, um, the live performance here, the live action, and because of that, we had some problems here uh, with our, um, I guess, video starting. Hopefully, you guys are. This, if not, we'll get it recorded and get it somehow today. But I want to go ahead and continue with chapter 11 on the Sefer Ha'ikarim, chapter 11. And we are moving in a good pace. And I want you to, to join us at the Ways of Israel. Uh, be part of what we're doing. There's a lot of things that we are doing reaching out, teaching, and so forth. Also, helping people who are wanting to to complete the conversion process as well out of here in South Florida as well as throughout the world. For more information you can reach us at 786-306-8211. That's the same number also if you wish to donate via Zelly you can do so directly at that number at 786-306-8211 and also our uh, PayPal account which is it's everywhere on this on this Facebook site so you can be able to donate that way as well. Now, starting with chapter 11, since all agree that the law of Moses gave the children of Israel is divine, says Rabbi Albo, it's fitting that we should make a, a test for the divine laws and prove them by it. Just as we use one individual of a given species of a type, if we desire to know the things that are essential necessarily, or necess ne ne necessary, to the existence and duration of every other member of the species, so it's proper that we should take the law of Moses as a type and assume that those things which are necessary for the existence and duration of the law of Moses are also things which we give existence or give existence and duration to divine law. Now, since we find that the law of Moses lays down in the very beginning the three principles above mentioned namely the existence of God, the divine revelation, the reward and punishment, it follows that we they are necessary principles of divine law. The reason they are laid down in, in this in the section of Bereshit or Genesis is to indicate that they are principles of divine law. Just as in every science the principles are first laid down upon which the science turns and by which are proved all other all the other prepositions that come to in that science. So, in section of Genesis, or Bereshit, are recounted the three matters different from each other, every one explaining one of the principles to indicate that they are fundamental principles of divine law upon which, upon which the con, all the contents turns. Now, thus, the passage in, in beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, these are the generations of the heavens that deals with one subject. And the purpose of the section is to teach the first principle, which is the existence of God who produces all things by his will to refute the opinions of the Epicureans sect who thought that the world came by by coincidence. It's like many atheists believe. It's all by co coincidence and no efficient cause. The cause, the entire narrative from in the beginning to these are the generations of the heavens turns upon this principle. For the order of succession of created things of different decrees and successive appearance of plant, animal, and man point to the existence of the very voluntary agent, as we'll explain in the second book of Hidakot uh, Ikarim, Ha'i Karim. This is just the first book that we're dealing with. This section also makes it clear that human species is the choicest of this low existence, and that man, in the main purpose of creation of the world, for man is related to the other classes of being, like plant and animal, as a form of intellectually is to matter, is in art that is a prerequisite to a given art in the position of preparatories, as a matter of art in question, which stands in relation to the form to the former, and all forms of being preceding the humans, the humans are also preparatory. Uh, to it in the position of the matter of the to human species, which is to them in relations to form. 
The reason why formation of man came later than that of the lower animals is ascribed to God himself to show that the purpose of the agent in creating the earlier species of plant animal was the existence of the human forms. For a man alone of lower existence know the existence of God. As soon as man made his appearance, creation was complete, and we read, and the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them, for the purpose of all things, came at the end of the work. Man is thus the end of creation, as the principal art is the end of the arts, which comes before it and exists for its sake. This entire portion of, uh, was written for the, no other pur purpose except to teach the first principle, the existence of a being who made all things. This is the reason why throughout this section the name Elohim or Elohim alone is used. Elohim is denoting one who has the power to produce all things. To show that the only purpose that the entire narrative in this section is to teach the existence of a being who made all existence into, in, into existence, into things, which is the first principle <clears throat> which Albo makes reference to. For these, from these, there are the generations of heavens, and, and the man knew his wife is another subject intended to bring about this second principle of the existence of our prophecy and divine revelation. This is why we find the entire narrative turns about divine law. Thus the first conversation God had with man was, and the Lord commanded the man, saying then that he comes to reason why man was given divine commandments rather than the lower animals. Out in all and out of the, of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto the man to see what he would call them. The meaning is that seeing that the man has an intelligence and knows the definition of animals better than any other creature, all the sublunar existence are subject to him and exist for his sake. But the purpose of man is to observe the commandments of his maker. For this reason he was placed in this world, symbolized by the Garden of Eden, that he may eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the garden in allusion to the Torah concerning which it says, She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. But if he violates the command of his maker, he will be driven out of the garden. The whole narrative of the Adam and Eve and the serpent is symbolic allusion to man's fortunes in this world. The serpent, whom our rabbis called Samuel, or Sam Samael, is the evil inclination with the assistance of a woman hinders man from attaining his perfection and causes him to be driven out of the garden, says Rabbi Albo. This is the reason why in the narrative of the expression, the Lord God, the yud Hey vav Hey Elohim, is used. It's meant to indicate that in order for man to attain his perfection, it's not sufficient that he believes in the existence of a creator, which is a conception of the agent who brings into, beings, uh, into being the things of nature and designated by the word of God, Elohim. But he must also believe in prophecy and divine revelation. This is a higher conception than that of the creative agency of bringing into being the thing of nature, the things of nature. In possession of faith that the commandments come from the Lord our God, man may eat of the tree of life and live forever. He cannot attain to this by virtue of the first knowledge alone. Namely, that there is a creator, but he must have in his addition the belief in prophecy and divine origins of the Torah, which commands the doing of those things which God's will, through natural reason, may not dictate it. This is something higher than the things of nature. <clears throat> to prevent the thought of the creator and the revealer of the Torah are two different persons, <clears throat> two different things. The introduction of the Ten Commandments reads, and God spoke all the words, saying, and the first commandment begins, I am the Lord God, thy God, to indicate that he who gave the law <clears throat> is who is the who is the representative by the tetragrammaton, the yod, the he, the vav, the he, or as we would say it, we would we would say it as the Lord. 
<clears throat> or Lord, in the same as the one who brought all things into being, who is called God, Elohim. In this chapter on creation, this is what we look at. This is also the reason why in Deuteronomy, Moses says, These words the Lord spoke unto all your assembly. To indicate that, that through the introductory words of the Ten Commandments in Exodus, it says, And God spoke all these words. The speaker in the same, as represented by the Tetragrammaton, the yod heh vav -Hey, thus the entire narrative from these are the generations of the heavens, and the man knew Eve, his wife, uses that same expression, the Lord God, to allude to the principle of prophecy and divine revelation. All the penalties mentioned in this section embraces the whole human race and are not confined to Adam and Eve alone. From, from and the man knew his, his wife, until this is the book of the generations of Adam, the text treats of another topic and has an allusion to the third principle, namely individual reward and punishment and divine providence as extending to particular incidents occurring in the world. Mentioned in this chapter is of a different nature from that that's mentioned in the preceding chapters, which will deal with Adam and Eve. There is Adam was punished, there Adam was punished because he violated the command of God which is the lesson to the whole entire human race. The essential cause of the punishment was transgression of the divine command. And the purpose of the story is to tell of the particular things that happened to Adam and Eve, and therefore all the punishments mentioned in the story of Adam and Eve embraces the whole human race. But in a certain section dealing with Cain and Abel, <clears throat> Cain and Abel, we also learn of more information here. Um, let me just get right over here one moment. <clears throat> and this is intended to show that God takes cognizance of evil doers. This is why we're told that in the, uh, on the account of Cain and Abel, Cain and the punishment him he punished him because of his intention when he brought an offering was not sincere. It was hypocrisy, with hypocrisy, and because he did violence to Abel, killing him, not merely because he violated divine command. This is intended to show that God takes cognizance of evildoers and punishes them for their evil intention, for their violent deeds. And though he may prolong his anger, as he did in the case of Cain, ultimately his exact punishment from them, as he did from Cain, paying him in his own coin. As Cain killed Abel and cut off his progeny, so was Cain killed, and all of his descendants were wiped out by the flood, not one remaining alive. And though among Cain descendants there were great, wise, and intelligent men, inventors of the arts and science, as we read, the fathers of the forger of every cutting instrument, brass and iron, the father of such as dwells in the tents and have cattle, the father of all such as handle the harp and the pipe. Nevertheless, God showed them no favor. They were musicians. As a matter of fact, from here we, we learn that they were the ones who developed the, the, the musical instruments. This is the purpose of the third section. For this reason, the word of the Lord alone is used to show that the individual pro individual providence touching all things that happen in the world by reasons of which everyone's fortune corresponded to his deed. It's not simply a natural result of existence of the Creator who brings into being the things of nature, nor is it as a result of the existence of the divine law, but it is due to the fact that God's perfection and goodness prompt him to look to look out for the lowly and the weak to save them from their oppressors the prophets allude to this when he says i dwell in high in the high and the holy place with him also this is is that of a contrite and humble spirit the meaning is that because of the goodness and exalted station 
it is becoming in him to look out for the lowly as to show them great power and revive the heart of the contract ones. The story of Cain and Abel also makes it clear that God's providence is pervaded by the equality of mercy and that he opens to the wicked ways of repentance. He opens them to Cain when he said, If thou doest well, shall it not be lifted up? This is more than just strict justice. For this reason, the name of God is not used in the story at all. Having explained these three dogmas, which are fundamental principles of the divine law, he now begins the narrative over again and gives a list of sequence of generations as before, beginning his count with the words, This is the book of the generations of Adam. The meaning is that here is the beginning of the book, all that has come before being the introduction stating the principles on which this book is based, but not forming part of itself. Every author in the beginning of his book gives its content, and so the words just mentioned tells us that the book of Genesis deals with the generations of Adam and the descent of mankind from him. These words indicate that it comes before is not part of the book, but expresses the principles of the book in the same way as the principles of science are laid down in the beginning of science. Thus, the verse, <clears throat> this is the book of the generations of Adam, is the beginning of the Torah, and it tells us that the book of Genesis is the account of the generations of Adam. The author continues, in the, in the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him male and female, and created he them. Now it would be, have been sufficient if he had just said, in the day that God created man, male and female created he them. them. The reason he adds, in the likeness of God made he him, is in order to allude to an important matter which is essential for the existence uh, of the Torah. The point is that individual reward and punishment, which we said, is one of the principles of the Torah can be attained by man by reason of his rational soul, which is the image of God. For it is by virtue of the rational soul that man attains a permanent life as an individual and thought worthy of reward and punishment as an individual, but not as by virtue of permanence he enjoys as a number of, of, of the species, an attribute which he has, uh, has in common with other animals. Thus, in the verse in question, when we read, which is the beginning of the Torah, makes reference of two kinds of continuity which man has. The expression in the likeness of God made he him alludes to the fact that man has, has, has an individual continuity like the celestial beings because he is in the likeness of Elohim, etc., the angels who have individual continuity. The expression male and female created he them alludes to the continuity man enjoys in the species which he shares in the lower animal world. Reproduction, in other words. They reproduce and they uh, continue their species. This is an illusion of the idea of Bereshit and Laba in the Midrash, commenting on the verse, let us make man in our image. So what does that mean? The rabbis say, with whom did he consult? Says Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, Yeshua son of Levi. He consulted with the domains of heaven and earth. The, means, the meaning is this. Up to the sixth day, before man was created, there was two different kinds of created things in this world. The celestial things, which have permanent existence as individuals, and the sublunar things, which enjoys permanent existence in the species, but not as individuals. Then God consulted with the celestial and the sublunals and said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, being in whom both powers are combined, individual and specific, individuals, individual permanence and like celestials, due to his rational power, specific permanence like the sublunars, by virtue of his material side. This will explain why the singular is used in the expression, and God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he, him. While in the expression of male and female created he, him, the pronoun is in the plural. The former refers to his permanence as an individual, which he enjoys over and above the other animals, and the later refers to the specific 
permanence which is due to the union of male and female. But this is, there's a difficulty here. And we find in Bereshit Labba the following story. When God dictated to Moses the verse, let us make man, Moses objected. And he said, why should you give the heretic an occasion for error, for mistake? And God said, write as a dictate. And if anyone desires to err, let him do so. Now it's clear that a thing which is good ought to exist, a thing which is bad ought not to exist. While a thing which is composed of good and evil should or should not exist according to according as the good and evil predominates. Now the expression attributed to God writes I, as I tell you, if anyone desires to err, let him err, let him do so. It seems like a case of submitting uh, to a, a small a small loss for the sake of a great benefit arising from some use of expression let us make let us make. But what can possibly be of great benefit resulting from the plural. Let us make. If we say it is a moral lesson that is that the great should not disdain the advice of the small, as God consulted with his denizen of heaven and earth, his own creatures, though he had no need to do so, the benefit is not so great to counterbalance the evil arising from the occasion for error which the expression furnishes to heretics. Here, by the way, Albo is referring to the heretics as those that believe that uh, a human person was being referred to many times back in that period of time, which is one of the Christian arguments. And even if we say that the benefit is the idea which we mentioned in the name of Rabbi Yeshua, son of Levi, the knowledge of a man has a rational faculty like the celestial as a material power like the lower existence and the rational faculty gives a man individual permanence, namely immortality for the soul of the individual person, which is a doctrine which is essential to the Torah, as we have seen, we must say in reply to this that although the teaching of such doctrine is indeed of a great benefit, the counterbalance of the harm arising from such possibility of errors by the heretics, i.e. Christianity, the question still remains, what necessity was there for writing, let us make man, with the pronouns in the plural? The text might have read, and God said to the celestial and terrestrial, I will make man in your image. In this way, the affirmation benefits would be realized, and there would be no need or room for heretical error. My opinion, and here comes Alba with how he understands this passage, is that though the benefits aforementioned would be realized by the text read, I will make man, the actual reading is, let us make man. Let us, in order to make the allusion to another point more profound at that same time essential. The existence of the celestials, which have individual continuity, indicate that they are the cause, they were caused by a being who has the ability and the power to endow individual things in permanent existence, as in the case of celestial beings. The existence of the terrestrial beings shows that they are the cause by a being who has power to perpetuate species, but not individuals. This might give rise to the erroneous opinion that there are two creative powers, which is the issue that many Christians believe to agree that uh, the, the, the Yashka is one of the powers that brought everything into existence. And here Abba goes directly to that point. As Elisha surnamed Asher's thought, hence to the next we read, let us make man in our image, as if the two powers who gave existence to two kinds of beings, the celestial and the terrestrial. And it said, let us make man, meaning that they agreed to make a single creature, man, in which should be united the two powers, the general powers that give specific permanence in a particular power that bestows individual permanence. A single being would from this combined nature make it clear to all the existence, celestial as well as terrestrial. They are products by the one being who possesses all the power. In this way we explain the expression, and God said, let us make God, Elohim, let us make man, God, who has all the power, the general in particular, united the two in one agreement, in agreement, and made man in whom are combined 
by the two qualities, general and particular, permanence, general due to the matter, particular due to the soul. The point to a single being in whom all the powers are united absolutely and shows that he, may, he who made the things which are permanent as individuals and the things which are permanent as species is the same one. This shows also that God, or this shows too that God's knowledge embraces particular things as we read as, as, as well as general. The latter idea is, is indicated in two ways. Thus, when God reveals himself to the righteous men in the Bible, he mentions them, their two names twice. Abraham, Abraham, and also Yaakov, Yaakov, and also Moshe, Moshe, Samuel, Samuel, to indicate that he knows the individual and his individuality. Similarly, the verse in Genesis, who Whosoever sheddeth the man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Oh, I wish we would, we would grave this into the very justice system of this country and other countries who should make it very clear that if a man, a human being, sheds the blood of another human being, his blood must be shed. How many harm would, would society basically uh, be freed from if they would put this part of the law of God into practice? For in the image of God made he man shows that God knows man as an individual. For if God's knowledge extended only to the species as his providence in respect to the other animals extends only to the conversation of the species or conservation of the species, what reason is there for punishing a murderer with death because in the image of God made he man? Since in killing one individual he has not destroyed the species. The Bible, therefore, says that because man was made in the image of God, because he has a permanence as an individual, he who kills him should be punished, for God knows him as an individual by reason of the rational faculty, which he possesses like a celestial being, who also have the individual permanence and are known by God individually by reason of their rational faculty. This is the reason, too why man deserves individual reward and punishment as is promised in the Torah. Now both of these things are essential to the existence of the Torah. The one has reference to God and the other uh, and that there are n not two gods as the heretics used to say. You know you have one God and then you have another a God that basically did all of this stuff. The God of the heaven is not the same as God of the earth. This is the belief this is the belief in the unity of God which Abraham spread among in the world as we find and I will partake and I will make thee swear by the Lord the God of heaven and the God of earth the second has reference to man that the God's knowledge of general and particulars was united in general in the creation of man and therefore man deserves reward and punishment because God knows him as an individual since he is in the image of God this Two, Abraham published abroad as we find him saying the Lord the God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my nativities the meaning is that though he is the God of heaven he nevertheless knew me as an individual spoke to me and made me a promise this is the reason for the expression let us make man and the statement of the rabbis is now clear that God said to Moses, Write, and I tell you, if anyone chooses to make a mistake, let him do so. The meaning is that the benefiting, the benefits of rising from the expression is great and essential to the Torah, pointing out that as, as, as it does, that he who made the individual of celestial world has the knowledge of them, is the same who made the terrestrial species, and he knows them too. There are not two powers, there are not two gods. Only one God created man in his image, not two different knowledges. With one knowledge he knows all. This is what Rabbi Ami meant in the passage of Bereshit Rabbah in reference to the expression, let us make man. The question is asked, with whom did he consult? Rabbi Ami, Rabbi Ami said he consulted with his knowledge. The meaning is that he did not consult with anyone else, but his own general individual knowledge for the purpose of making a single being 
whose nature should clearly indicate that the divine knowledge is one. This will is accomplished by uniting the new creature by the general and particular knowledge. In other words, by making him a human being. Being in the image of God like the celestial being. He shows clearly that God knows him individually. And being made male and female, he shows that God looks out for him as a species. So now we see that the whole idea of let us make man is more profound than perhaps many initially think, interpreting it incorrectly to some sort of tr uh, trinity. This shows that God is absolutely one and that man deserves individual reward and punishment because he is in the image of God. So just like the body, the physicality has to be judged, likewise the spiritual aspect, the celestial aspect as well, because he is in the image of God. And this is why in this verse, which is the beginning of the Torah, as we read before, we read, In that day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. We're going to pause here. We're finished chapter 11. In our chapter 12 of uh, Sefer HaKarim is the, our 12 chapters. And every chapter is part of the first book of Sefer HaKarim. There's six books. So we have a lot of material to cover. And I hope you're enjoying this entire series that we're doing here live on the ways of Israel. If you have any questions, feel free to write. And may God bless you. And remember, give tzedakah. It is an incredible thing when you do so. May God bless you and strengthen you. May God reward you. And if necessary, do corrective action if, if need be. God bless.